right yo 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 again definitely need to fix that intro because it really does cut short very sharply and as somebody who is such a fan of audio as i am as you know it pains me to have such a brisk exit of that tune which is an immense tune a tune that i actually sampled that was that was a tune that i made and i don't know if you know that um sampled obviously i didn't make all parts of it but uh, anyway welcome to vox world ladies and gentlemen boys and girls i am kane sims your host as always and i am delighted to uh, welcome our sponsor for this episode of vox world which is deepgram uh, deepgram are an automatic speech recognition company they provide apis that allow you to take audio like this transcribe it into text like the text that you will see on your screen screen right now deepgram.com forward slash vux world which is where you can go if you want to try it out um it's just literally had a few updates now uh deepgram it now supports french language french canadian language has had some updates to spanish some updates to hindi uh the actual model itself has been updated as well so now it's a bit better with actual conversational ai applications it's better at uh, uh meeting subs- uh, subscribing meeting notes it's actually got a very specific model for earnings calls which is interesting as well um so whether whatever your uh, needs are in the transcription space in the asr space do check out deepgram.com forward slash vux world deepgram are literally one of the leading providers out there incredibly cost effective incredibly high accuracy and the team at deepgram as well if you are looking at different providers will actually do a benchmark where they will take your audio samples your training data and they will sample it across all of the various different speech recognition providers out there and give you a genuine appraisal of how deepgram performs in comparison and i suspect you won't be let down so Check out deepground.com forward slash VUX world. Okay, so our guest today is Jan Sedevi. I'm going to welcome Jan on screen right now. Jan, welcome. Hello, everybody. To VUX world. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. So, Jan, you are, um, I described you in the, in the invite in the LinkedIn event for this uh, episode as an absolute veteran of the voice AI space, because I think you are one of the few people who has, you know, you've been involved in it for a long time, but especially before it was uh, cool. It seems as though everybody wants to be involved in voice and conversational AI now, but you've got some real deep experience, uh, which I'm dying to get into during the course of the conversation. And more recently, you were guiding and leading the team at the Czech Technical University who won the Alexa Prize Social Bot Grand Challenge in 2021. Uh, so very, very well done and congratulations on that and, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Yes, uh, unfortunately, you can call me or you may call me a veteran, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you must have seen a lot of developments. I mean, we had similar. We've had similar conversations with, um, you know, people who used to work at like your likes of uh, Nuance uh, back in the day and stuff like that. I say back in the day. It's not even back in the day. It's like nineties, really. It's it's still re- fairly new technology in terms of its uh, application in the world. I know that you can go back far enough to the thirties and whatnot, shoebox and all that kind of stuff to to show the kind of the the history of it, but practical usage has actually still in the grand scheme of things still relatively new like 90s late 80s maybe was it yeah well i actually started to work uh, on speech at the university and it was uh, like uh, middle of 80s and uh, then uh, starting uh, from 92 this was after the revolution because you know i'm from the so-called former communist country so after the got back to real world uh, i was able to be hired uh, to ibm uh, tj watson in uh, new york in the us and uh, there i started the real professional career uh, working on speech recognition with people like fred jelinek david nahamu lali Ball, etc etc so there is a large crowd of people who were the real pioneers and uh, I was uh, very fortunate uh, I uh, enlarged the crowd and helped to get the first product uh, on the market which was uh, first voice type and then via voice and uh, we had in 95 the first uh, machine or the first software which was running on PC and at that time it was 486 uh, these CPUs were very, very weak, much, much weaker than our cell phones today. So it really took an enormous effort to get the speech record on it. You know, it was a lot of calculations uh, to really uh, make it uh, do something reasonable. And that time, 
you know, it was an amazing team. And uh, we all, since, since we were really very enthusiastic about speech, uh, we all thought that next year this will be the year of speech. But it took many years, you know, like uh, 2016 or 17, I don't know exactly. Alexa was put on the market or 2010 uh, Google Voice Search. Uh, was on the market or it might be 2009 i don't know exactly now so it took a very long time uh, before speech matured uh, so as to be used uh, uh, reasonably well mm. do you is it because that these days now you know most people are running you know fairly quick computers there's a hell of a lot of processing power in a mobile phone there is cloud technology and infrastructure that can be scaled at will do you think that is the the computing power is the thing that's enabled it, or is there something? Because you mentioned there that you had speech recognition models running on you know old kind of like small processors and stuff in in the nineties. Is it computing power that's fueled it, or is it accuracy? Like, what is it? Do you think that's that's well, led eventually to to where? Yeah, we I, I think that I think you hit it or you named it. Uh, it that's a combination of uh, things uh, which are the evolution of the whole IT industry. So. First of all, we have a lot of data, uh, not only textual data, but also uh, voice because we are recording people talking. Well, not my company, but the companies who do the speech are, uh, you know, recording people talking. And uh, therefore, they have like uh, hundreds or thousands of hours of uh, voice. That's first. Second, the language modeling, uh, which is an important part of all ASR. Uh, is uh, benefiting a lot for from things like common crawl where there are terabytes or petabytes of data so we can create uh, language models like uh, GPT-3 and so on. And uh, also uh, the cloud computing which is required to have this uh, billion parameters, uh, uh, neural networks or models. So all this together, uh, you know, clicked together around 2013, 2014. And uh, this is the time uh, when we really saw uh, some big change because of this large or deep neural network. And these days, uh, all the systems are running uh, on some combination of uh, deep neural network as opposed to what we did in 95, where we had a mixture of Gaussians the Gaussians were 30 dimensional. So at that time, it was like uh, almost impossible to calculate it. Uh, but these days, we, uh, the, the, the enumeration is like uh, millions time uh, better. And therefore, also the accuracy is much higher. Certainly, there is still a lot of things uh, to do to understand uh, all the uh, variations uh, how people speak and especially in noisy environments and uh, you know lack of good microphones some cell phones have two microphones one uh, recording the background noise and the other one uh, focusing on the speaker and doing some speech enhancement so as to improve the accuracy so uh, there are a lot of techniques and uh, a lot of research and uh, step by step these things are all the time improving and you mentioned DeepGram. This is uh, one of the companies uh, trying uh, to benefit from neural networks. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So your time at IBM, you mentioned speech recognition. W w were you involved in... What what was your role in that respect? Was were you like one of the engineers working on the technical side, or you on the business yes. side trying to get it implemented places? Like, what was your scope in in terms of what uh, you're working? As on? I mentioned, I worked in TJ Watson, where TJ Watson is a research uh, part of uh, IBM. It is in upstate New York, and mm -hmm. uh, I was in the speech team uh, with the people I named. These were basically. Yeah researchers and these were the pioneers like Raimo Pakis. Uh, there is still a hidden Markov models scheme which is named uh, after Raimo. So uh, these, these were the really very early days of uh, uh, speech recognition. And uh, I actually had a chance, I worked for IBM for 16 years, uh, starting at 92. So I also uh, touched the product because I was, uh, it was in end uh, or 96, 97, I started to write 
the uh, via voice uh, which is a version of uh, speech recognition dedicated or embedded uh, into cars because even that days uh, IBM was providing uh, the code I touched uh, to companies such as Honda Acura and uh, North Star etc etc et so uh, these were the very early engines since uh, people had a chance to do the while in the car. Wow, interesting. I think there's a whole podcast episode in that, I think, in, in and of itself, in terms of the history of voice in the car and stuff like that. Um, we, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe save that for another for another episode because I definitely want to get on to the, the, Alexa, uh, the Alexa prize. But you after know, IBM... Speech people are very, uh, very, di- very different or very unique pack of different people, you know? So Yeah. <laughs> all of us each other so it's very funny interesting interesting um so after ibm you're at google so what, yes. were, you, what, so what were you doing at google i actually uh, when i left ibm this was at the moment where ibm sold all the patents including my patents to nuance so that time uh, sort of uh, the research group uh, had uh, or the future of the research group was not cl- very clear. And uh, besides speech, of course, at that time, uh, we were already doing NLP and we were moving more uh, towards practical applications. So I decided, uh, okay, uh, let's stop with speech and uh, let's see something different. And at that time I was all the, uh, admi- admiring what's going on in Google with this search, you know, they, they, they did a fantastic job. This was real a change. Uh, after Alta Vista, we were able to search the internet and the results made sense. So I really admired Google. So 2010, I joined Google. Uh, but uh, I sort of, uh, I, I liked the company. I learned there a lot. Uh, but uh, I was there a big manager. And somehow I was distancing myself uh, from the real people, the real people who are touching keyboard and uh, writing code and understand the algorithms. And uh, I finally found found out that uh, probably uh, this is what I want to do. So I went back to my alma mater and I started to put together a team of uh, or bunch of young uh, people who were interested in uh, computing uh, algorithms, uh, be it ASR, text-to-speech, NLP, uh, uh, NLG, and stuff like that. And uh, step by step, it t- took quite a long time. Step by step, I, uh, you know, taught students, and I had PhD students in 2016. Three of my uh, PhD students left the team. And they create a company, Rosum. And uh, just uh, three weeks ago, uh, they raised 100 million US dollars in A round. Wow. This was after leaving uh, my, my wow. team. I wow. was really, uh, I was not happy because these guys <laughs> were really good. And uh, the fact that they raised uh, in A round uh, 100 million US dollars from Czech Republic, which is for me unbelievable. You know? Wow. This wow. is fantastic. Uh, so you didn't have any uh, agreement with them then, which was... No, I didn't have any agreement. <laughs> <laughs> <You are right. laughs> what was, what's the name of the company? Uh, Rosum. It's double S. It's actually Ros- uh, Rosum's Universal Robot. It's actually a uh, oh, yeah. play by Karel Chapek, and that's the game... Uh, or play where for the first time the word robot was coined. Actually, robot right. was invented by Karel Chapek and uh, our Alquist, uh, it's a, uh, the, the name Alquist is a name of a character in this play. And that's uh, because it's a, a science fiction. This Alquist, this is the last human being on the planet of Earth in that play. Right. He was actually the author of Robots Who Took Over uh, the Earth. So I recommend to read the play. It's a very, very thin book, very interesting. It was uh, actually written in 1920. So can you imagine wow. in 1920 such an imagination? Wow. Wow. It's uh, like seeing into the future, isn't it? 
Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> a future that we're kind of just starting to get get a hold of. Oh, that's interesting. That's wicked. So, so, so a few PhD students left. They created Rossum, and uh, seems as though they're having great success. The team that that is there now is obviously still having great success as well, because you, at some point in time, found the Alexa Prize. Where did where did that come from? Yes, uh, it actually started in 2016 because 2016 Amazon announced uh, uh, competition for academic teams and mm -hmm. uh, that time uh, we were working on question answering and uh, language modeling and all this stuff and I had a new bunch of uh, PhD students and they that time uh, they were still learning a lot but uh, we thought so why not to try to sign up? So we wrote a proposal and uh, I didn't expect that uh, we will get uh, further, but uh, we were very lucky we get uh, to, we got to semi-final and semi-final it was uh, nine teams out of 100 plus teams uh, Amazon selected wow. based uh, on the proposal. And uh, this entitled us for getting 250K as a grant for sponsoring students. So we, okay, we, at that time, we tried to run various uh, language models like uh, deep neural networks, but uh, 2016, uh, 16, this still uh, didn't work very much. Uh, these uh, systems were very much hallucinating. And so we thought, okay, forget all these fancy stuff and uh, let's do what's appropriate so as it works. So we created the first Alquist and uh, it started somehow to work and uh, uh, we, or Amazon actually, uh, put uh, the pod uh, on their AWS and all the owners of Alexa uh, could say, Alexa, let's chat. You can still do it today. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you say, Alexa, let's chat, uh, uh, some of the three winning pods at this moment will open and you can test to talk to the bot. The, these days, the three bots, the three winners are not very much different. It's very much similar experience, but uh, obviously uh, this, the, the end of the first competition was uh, 2017. So uh, till today, it made uh, significant progress. So these days, the robots or the bots are uh, having or conversing with the users in much smoother way and they are much smarter and uh, they have lots of knowledge behind, etc. Mm, yeah. So we had uh, Chanda Katri on the podcast a couple of weeks back, one of the, the uh, founding fathers, I suppose you could say, of uh, of the Alexa Prize. So the social, so definitely I'd advise people to check that out if, if you're interested. It's, it's an immense conversation about, we touch on the Alexa Prize, but it's more about the future of natural language understanding, which uh, which is really interesting. Um, so, but the Alexa Alexa Prize, for those that don't know, there's a couple of different kind of um, challenges, isn't there? Like they had the task bot, which was to try and get people to create a bot that's really good at completing certain tasks. They've got the social bot, which the aim is that you are trying to create a bot that can have a 20 minute long conversation with a human without falling over, without breaking and maintaining the conversation. Is that, is that a correct description of the scope? Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking about Chandra, I had a lot of discussions with him and uh, we now and then are having a course, uh, you know, talking about the future. He's not in Amazon anymore, but he's a great guy. So I really enjoy talk to him. And uh, yes, uh, you described it very well. Social bot is a, a kind of bot uh, which is capable of carrying, engaging and entertaining conversation for as long as possible so uh, this is not a goal oriented application like for a bank where the goal is to figure out what is on your banking account or uh, do some transfer or whatever and then that's it you are finished uh, our bot is bot where we don't know what the user wants to talk about ahead because there are lots of topics like sports celebrities politics, uh, gossips, uh, joke of the day, and uh, you name it. You know, the, 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 the spread of topics is endless. 
So we have to, to be able to handle everything as certainly we don't handle everything because if you start the uh, discussion asking about parachuting or crocodiles, uh, you know, you can imagine that uh, this is giving us hard time. Uh, but uh, these days uh, we have uh, in our system already uh, these generative uh, transformer based uh, neural networks and we handle even these very tricky uh, questions or very tricky opening sentences and uh, we somehow uh, get away reasonably well. Mm, interesting. So the aim of, from Amazon's point of view, I can see what the trajectory is for them. I mean, Chandra was mentioning that a lot of things that came out of the Alexa Prize have actually ended up being incorporated into some of the core technology uh, in the Alexa platform, like Alexa Conversations apparently came out of the Alexa Prize. And so it's definitely aligned with Amazon's, I suppose, goal of having uh, Alexa be, yes, your assistant, but also your kind of uh, companion, I suppose, a thing that you build trust in. And, you know, over time, if you trust it, you will end up uh, ultimately shopping on it, but 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 more than that as well. Um, <laughs> more than yes, that. You, you, are, you are absolutely right, <laughs> because uh, there is Alexa and the other one is Google Home or Hub or whatever they call it mm -hmm. now, some strange name, I don't know why Hub. And uh, uh, basically, uh, b both of these team or each of these team has a slightly different target, uh, because obviously Amazon is... Uh, uh, e-commerce and they'd like to sell and uh, Google uh, wants to have as many customers as possible so uh, both of them are trying to get the customers or attract the customers and uh, uh, at the beginning was word right mm. and people like to talk to each other people like to gossip people like uh, to exchange views and that's uh, basically what is uh, I don't know Facebook about and mm -hmm. people are writing Facebooks for themselves and here uh, we have some artificial robot and the robot should create the other part for people to converse because mm -hmm. if we were able uh, to create a robot like this and I believe this is what is behind uh, Amazon's uh, competitions and so on and Chandra knows uh, definitely more than me from the, the background in or the way uh, how they think about this competition or why they started uh, in Amazon. But uh, I believe that uh, both of these companies uh, want to create a companion uh, who will take care about uh, your well-being or who can coach you or who can help you negotiate price or deal with uneasy people. So we can name millions of different tasks uh, where something which will be running on our cell phone uh, will give us advice or uh, we may ask questions even though uh, i don't know if you have google home or alexa and mm -hmm. I, I think that we uh, myself i don't ask very frequently questions like how many people live in i don't know paraguay so mm -hmm. it, it, it knows all these answers but uh, mm -hmm. what i am trying to say uh, that uh, maybe I don't need these uh, nifty answers uh, that frequently. Mm. I brought someone who understands me or who can give me a uh, good time or uh, where I can exchange my views and see maybe a different view more uh, than uh, the population of Nicaragua. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that makes sense. So you kind of touched on something there around uh, around your likes of Alexa. Um, if you ask it a random question, it will give you an answer, providing it knows the answer. If it doesn't, that request is likely sent somewhere for it to be reviewed. It then gets populated with an answer through Alexa answers or through how, whatever the other processes are. So over time, it obviously will understand more questions. Same thing with Google as it indexes more of the web and voice enables most of the web. And same thing with Siri as it populates its knowledge base and stuff like that. But they only give you an answer the, to the question. They don't start a conversation to the if you asked what's the what's the por, um, population of Paraguay, you might get an answer in X many million, but you won't also get a prompt that says, "Why are, are you thinking of traveling there soon?" Oh well, yeah, I'm thinking, and so you know, answering a question is one thing, but maintaining a conversation for twenty minutes is a totally different ballgame. 
Well, you are absolutely right. Uh, Google has like uh, 5 billion of uh, entities in their knowledge graph. And uh, in the average, they have like uh, 100 different facts for each entity, which is incredibly huge database. And uh, you can ask like, uh, who was the wife of GF JFK? Or you can ask uh, any questions of this type, because this is all in their uh, graphs. Uh, also, uh, there are databases like uh, IMDB or ESPN and so on, where you can use APIs and request uh, questions about who was the star in Mission Impossible or how old this, uh, this and that guy and so on. And uh, all this is uh, doable. But uh, it is interesting that uh, people are not that much interested in these facts. Uh, because if you uh, go sometimes with a public transport and uh, you just uh, listen to two women talking to each other, uh, you will very quickly uh, find out that uh, they are talking very quickly, but you don't know about what, because it's always like, yes, I told you, ah, you told me, I remember, but I didn't understand very much, and he, tell, he told me something too, and yes, I agree, that's it, that's it. And it goes <laughs> like this, and you have no idea what they are talking about. <laughs> You know, so uh, dialogue is very tricky thing, and I don't know if we ever uh, have these capabilities because obviously uh, there is something uh, the the two people are uh, they have some associations uh, to each other and they also have some uh, strategy in how they talk and uh, there is some reasoning behind it and uh, planning, strategizing, reasoning. We are far away, like mm. decades, well, maybe, not, well, probably decades, because what we know today, it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's like uh, we are only repeating uh, what we've heard. So it's uh, mm. nothing that, uh, you, you know, AI in media is always uh, painted as uh, something uh, wonderful and uh, something uh, which is uh, going to kill us or I, I don't know many of these disastrous thoughts uh, but we are still far away mm. but we are clo closer now than we ever have been that's for sure <laughs> but, still, but still miles away but <laughs> i suppose i suppose the question i was trying to get to is like You've been given a challenge, which is to create a bot that can design a conversation for 20 and have a conversation for 20 minutes. Um, we already have assistants that can answer a lot of questions. And you could just carry on going for 20 minutes if you wanted to. Who was the star of James Bond? Oh, who, who played uh, the main character in Big? You know, what's Tom, Tom Hanks's middle name? And you could keep on going. But that's not really a conversation. That's just a bunch of I questions being fired and absolutely. answered. So where do you start you know, maybe even take it back four years ago when you first joined and, and entered the Alexa Prize for Social Bot. Where do you start in trying to think about how to design a conversation that is intended to last 20 minutes? Well, uh, we played the Wizard of Oz. Uh, we took students and uh, we asked them to talk to each other. And uh, uh, we were like uh, record they are talking about to find out uh, what are the topics. Uh, then... Uh, we do. We did the visit of us uh, over some. I think that that time it was Skype. So uh, and uh, we manually transcribed what they were talking, and uh, out of that uh, we uh, did some distillation of some sentences, but uh, everything manually and everything very in a very very absolutely simple way. No no magic, you know, the, just mm. the street smart, and then. Uh, we transformed these sentences uh, to these topics. We knew there is IMDb, uh, there I can find uh, probably all the movies. I know that they are publishing the movies, uh, going to uh, movies uh, next weekend. So we, we knew how to ask about the stars and uh, when the movie was uh, made, etc. So based on that, uh, we created artificial dialogues and then we used, again, students to talk to it and to see uh, uh, if uh, the dialogue goes or if the dialogue breaks. And uh, when we saw some problem, uh, we fixed the dialogue and we went ahead. And uh, for doing this, or first we did it sort of very in a very 
very simple way and then uh, understanding a little bit more we found out have to do uh, various modifications of sentences and we added uh, intent recognition first like fast text and cosine similarity uh, then we added entity recognition so as to understand what they talk about uh, then we added the access to these databases uh, then we uh, go, went to Reddit and do uh, something like uh, information retrieval about trivia or in fun facts or stuff like that. And we have been selecting those where the thumbs up are high and uh, we selected those which are not too long. And, uh, you know, first we use like uh, Elasticsearch with very simple, uh, very simple TF-IDF algorithm and then later on, uh, we started to use like uh, deep passage retrieval based on, again on uh, embeddings and uh, recently as i already said uh, we are adding these generative models so we are making uh, big progress and uh, you can you know if uh, uh, if you follow the various types of uh, bots or if you could compare them at this moment, first running one and then running the other two, you will see the difference. Mm, interesting. So what stage was it at? Because the first Alexa challenge, you came second, and then you came second and second again. So yeah. you were runner-up three years in a row. What was the... Um, where? What stage were you at, at for the first one? Had, so you've gone through this process of having students talk to each other and you recognize what they're talking about and the, co the topics of conversation. You take some sample dialogues, you build a, a rudimentary model, you test that, you learn, you iterate, you expand, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're dipping into databases, you can extract data and you can start to build something that's a bit more robust. You're improving your language models, all that kind of stuff. When you first entered the Alexa Prize Social Bot Grand Challenge, was all of that in place? Like, what, what's the difference between... Oh. In timeline, it's all the stuff that you've mentioned about what you'd added. What was the difference in timeline between where you started in the well, first uh, social bot versus where as it I, uh, As I uh, named uh, the different uh, algorithms, uh, we are improving the quality of algorithms. It's uh, uh, not only that we are changing from very simple ones to uh, more sophisticated ones, which certainly take more CPU power, but uh, we are also better in fine tuning and we are also collecting a lot of data from uh, dialogues. So all this data from dialogues are helping us to tune up the models and make the models better. But uh, one of the very important factors which I believe made us a little bit better in 21 uh, when we won was that we really had uh, we were lucky actually because of the COVID students were at home so uh, we had a lot of testers who helped us to actually fiddle out many details because when you when you do it uh, you forget uh, to to fix this and to fix that and there is some threshold and this threshold was not updated and millions of these uh, neglect sort of uh, bugs because of neglecting to put it together uh, precisely so uh, many of these were found fixed and this really led to much better performance mm. how much did you obviously the alexa the alexa prize is it's kind of like a, a partnership i suppose between the people who enter and amazon and obviously there's a lot of prize money at the end of it to continue to use to continue the research and all that kind of stuff but like as a typical company uh, if you were to build on on Alexa and use the Alexa framework, you're essentially you can train the NLU. But for those that haven't built a skill before, you can you can train the NLU, provide training data, but you can't really tweak things like the thresholds and confidence scores and do anything about that stuff. You pretty yeah. much just, you, you, yeah. you just got a dialogue manager. You can do your integrations to IMDb if you want to. You provide some sample data for some intents, but in terms of what you get back from Amazon when your skill is live, you'll just get an intent. Okay, this one is an intent which is movie stars and the slot value is Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible or, or you know, actor Mission Impossible. So you get very limited data back. So in order to build something as sophisticated as, as Alquist, 
<laughs> well, was, there, was there further partnership, further access, further transparency and stuff like that throughout the process? Yes, uh, certainly uh, I would say that uh, uh, Amazon as well as Google are doing a good job in providing tools and uh, you really hit the nail uh, that uh, uh, you cannot do as uh, fine tuning uh, in the sense of uh, development as we can, you know, because you are left, for example, with the speech uh, with, or with the text which is delivered to you after the ASR has been applied. So, for example, if there is an acronym or if there is a word which is a name of company or some, some uh, name of place somewhere in uh, India or I don't know where, where the spelling is very different from what is the expected spelling uh, from English, there you are in trouble. So certainly if you, for example, like deep ground, uh, deep ground, then they may tune up the stuff for you and uh, there you uh, you are, uh, you can do a better uh, bot for particular purpose. But of course it takes uh, much more effort. It's not for free. So you mm -hmm. have to have developers, you have to have developers who understand the details. You know, you can, uh, these days, many students are uh, very much enthusiastic or after uh, AI and basically uh, any of these uh, big companies starting with Google over Amazon to Microsoft everybody is offering you some NLP set of tools and uh, many students are just pulling down the code and using it as a black box so they take the data and there is a lot of data on the internet for free too. They pull the data to the black box. And as a result, there is something like accuracy. And the accuracy is say 78%. So they get back to me and they say it's 78%. And uh, I'm always giving them a question. And can you do better? <laughs> and they say, no, I just put it there and it was 78 because uh, they don't know what is in the black box you know yes. and it reminds me on school kids when you give them some i don't know multiplication they say it's 375 and i say uh, it's not correct and they say but i used calculator <laughs> So, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we have these black boxes and we have many of them, but we still have to understand what's behind. Yeah. Interesting. So, so when you're, you, so during the Alexa prize, then you don't get any access to any additional tooling. That uh, would be actually, actually, we got access to uh, confidence scores. So when you do the speech recognition, uh, the last step of speech recognition is uh, estimating the right sentence. And for every, well, I would simplify the explanation. For every word in a sentence, uh, you have a list of candidates, and the candidates have a certain confidence score. So uh, you can play uh, with these uh, confidence scores to select slightly a different sentence or exchange two, three words in a sentence uh, instead of using the top ranking sentence the speech record is returning you and I believe that also the uh, model the ASR model was fine-tuned for conversation instead of uh, fine-tuning it for question answering mm. uh, but uh, I don't know the exact details because uh, this is something uh, what we had actually Amazon was uh, helping us we during uh, the development we have every week uh, a call and during that call uh, we spoke with uh, people who are in the process of developing uh, Alexa applications and we were exchanging views uh, they were helping us with uh, you know uh, answering certain uh, questions if we are in doubts and certainly uh, many teams were uh, very happy with uh, getting help how to run AWS uh, mm -hmm. also uh, Amazon had for all the participants uh, their own system uh, which was different than what uh, customers get and this system uh, 
uh, was, uh, you know, wrapping up various algorithms uh, from uh, or developed in Amazon, which uh, were on these uh, algorithms are working people from research. We have not used almost anything out of it because uh, we have been running it uh, completely on our own platform, uh, mm -hmm. which we have developed. Uh, this is the technology base, and uh, mm -hmm. the Alquist is uh, running on this technology base, uh, which certainly was also running in AWS or in, on AWS servers. Mm, interesting. So that 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 will be Flowstorm, I'm assuming. Which um, yes, which that's correct. Yeah. So we'll we'll get we'll we'll get to Flowstorm. We'll chat about that uh, in a second, but. Before we get to that, I just wanted to kind of like round up on on this process because, as you mentioned, like Amazon Alexa is already fairly good, and Siri and Google, and actually getting better over time. If you look at the studies that have been done at like, if I ask my voice assistant two thousand questions, how many times does it give me a correct answer? And in twenty seventeen, if you did that, the answers were like forty percent to sixty percent accurate, I think. And then over the years, as those studies get repeated, they actually get better and better. And every voice assistant has got better and better over the years at answering more questions. But as we mentioned, that's not the same as having a conversation. And so the the process you were describing and going through there from the kind of like product strategy side and the process of building it, starting from listening to normal, real conversations, then creating the model, then testing it and continue testing it. And then, you know, building up your language model that way and then pulling in APIs to data sources and then, you know, doing some fancy stuff on the technical side to maybe increase the the NLU accuracy or whatever, whatever, whatever these things have been, have been, but that doesn't necessarily give you, a conversation still it, that still might just get you a, a nice way of recognizing an intent extracting some entities and then finding an answer and giving them an answer back a conversation needs to have kind of like a give and take a two-way kind of thing so how did you or do you approach it from a perspective of like designing follow-on prompts for example like if i was to ask a question about the actor in missing impossible for that to be like truly conversational i would give you the answer but then i might prompt you with something else i might try and take yeah, you into the conversation how, how did you approach that side of things because that's like the glue that will stitch a lot of these interactions together into a conversation isn't it uh, that's precisely what we, or how you described it this is precisely what we are doing so for example uh, if uh, there is a, you know, we open the dialogue and we may say, so how are you doing? And then the person says, uh, well, I am doing very well, but my dog doesn't feel well. And uh, okay, so we understand that was a dog and we don't have any dialogue about dogs prepared or we don't know what to say about dogs. But uh, uh, we have this sentence and we have the generative model, which is this large language model. So what we can do, we, we have two choices. Either we can uh, go to Reddit and find out something about dogs and how dogs are feeling. I don't know if there's anything about how dogs are feeling, but there is definitely something about dogs. And we select some trivia or some fun fact. So if the guy says, my dog doesn't feel well, uh, then we may say, and did you know that this and that dog was running for 200 miles to follow his uh, whatever master mm -hmm. and uh, something funny like that. And then ending this, uh, we, would, we would ask the person, and what is your favorite movie? And that way uh, we are uh, simply switching the topic to what uh, to to the, where we are prepared to uh, talk to the guy today we do it even smarter because uh, uh, we have these uh, models the NLG natural language generation so with the NLG model uh, we send out the trivia and we ask uh, the user something and the user says something you know it doesn't matter what and uh, because uh, the most frequently used dialogue act in human beings speech is acknowledgement so even if he says no or he says well that's really surprising or there might be some phrase like this so we say well that's great and again <laughs> we put there the question and did you know that uh, tomorrow is going to be storm and uh, this is again prepared you know this uh, is yeah. hanging in our database so that way we are unwinding uh, the dialogue 
Right. So you're not waiting for the user to ask a question and you're not always responding with a prompt to ask. So in the transactional style bots that you alluded to at the beginning, like the banking bot or whatever, typically a prompt from the bot will be kind of like a question to the user and the user would give the answer. The user might then ask a question and get an answer, but the answer would typically be followed up with, let's get back on track and ask you a next question. But what's interesting here is that your responses are not always a question to the user. It's sometimes a fact that invites a comment about the fact. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's very important uh, because, uh, you know, like uh, asking the user, so what do you think? You know, uh, and then the user says something, you know, whatever. And uh, what, the user, what the user says uh, might bring us some information to create uh, a user profile uh, in a, a good sense of the word because obviously these days uh, everybody is... Uh, hysteric about privacy and security and so on. So we try, you know, if you talk to a friend of yours, uh, a friend of yours know that uh, where you live or uh, where you went to school or what car, what car you drive and uh, I don't know, all these details. And uh, when you meet, uh, then uh, you may say, okay, so is your old car still running? And you say, yes, still running, you know, so... Uh, that's that's the conversation. So we try to collect uh, this part, or we try to get uh, the knowledge out of the sentences. So, for example, uh, what is the latest movie you you saw? That's uh, one of the questions or something similar. And the user may say, "Well, yesterday I saw uh, X and Y movie with my sister." And uh, because uh, we are prepared or we know that they frequently talk about uh, their partners or girlfriends or boyfriends or as well as family. So we are prepared and we extract the information that uh, he was talking about sister, brother or whatever. And uh, immediately uh, we issue a question. So what's your, I didn't know you have a sister. What's her name? And right. he says uh, her name is X and Y. So we put it into a database. And when the guy gets back to the bot next week, uh, we start the conversation saying, so what is your sister Alice doing these days? <laughs> you know, so Very clever. It's, but uh, people do the same. Yeah, You know, when you meet someone after like one week, so you say, so how is the family doing? Yeah. Or, you know, something of that nature. And then uh, you unwind uh, the dialogue. Interesting. And that's then how you will, yeah, that's then how you can then, I suppose, you've always got something up your sleeve then. If there's something that, if, if a user says, in terms of like the aim of continuing the conversation, if the conversation is like drying up a little bit, but you know that the user has mentioned that they have a white car and they've got a sister called Mary, you've always got an extra little something up your sleeve to then exactly. bring the conversation back and re-kick it off again, haven't you? And that way you are building something uh, which is uh, like a knowledge, knowledge graph, but uh, about the person. So if you go, uh, you know, there are ontologies like schema.org, uh, where there is an entity person and the entity person, it has like tremendous number of uh, parameters. It's hierarchical. So if it's a sportsman, then a number of medals or victories or uh, what is the sport and etc. So, uh, you know, you can imagine Rio Messi, right? So mm -hmm. there are like a lot of information about guys like that. So all this is, uh, you know, on a silver plate uh, to pick it up and talk about it. Interesting. And what what does, um, in order to put this all together, you mentioned that obviously you have uh, access and guidance around AWS and stuff like that, but you also mentioned that you decided to use Flowstorm. Tell us a bit about Flowstorm and why, like, what does it give you that wasn't able to be repeated elsewhere? Well, uh, yes, uh, thank you for this question. This helped us a lot uh, because Flowstorm is a platform. So it has basically two pieces. Uh, one piece is a user interface. So through your browser, 
uh, you can in a cut and paste graphical way construct the dialogue graphs and the other part is the deployment so on any server uh, which has kubernetes which is a tool for deploying uh, applications uh, we can deploy uh, the the ready uh, or the, the mate dialogue through the graphical part of flowstorm and uh, so we used uh, this technology for creating uh, many different dialogues as te and testing it so uh, there are uh, like uh, if i oversimplify it uh, then there are uh, in flowstorm two basic uh, nodes one node is uh, what is being uh, uh, what is being sent to the user in terms of audio so you type a sentence and goes to TTS and uh, tells something to the user and the other boxes these are expected answers and behind that is uh, built in NLP pipeline where the NLP pipeline processes these answers and compares the answers uh, to the expected answers which were prepared in the dialogue manager or in flowstorm in this software which is organizing and creating the tree how the whole uh, dialogue may, may go and uh, based on that uh, you push a button and you can immediately uh, test it uh, in flowstorm around the dialogue uh, you have access to variables uh, we have also uh, part of the system is a programming language uh, which is kotlin that's a primary uh, Android programming language so we can do uh, many things like accessing the internet and uh, inventing or calculating stuff and so on so on so it's a huge system so anybody is welcome to try it we have uh, the try or the, the version for trying to use it uh, on the flowstone.ai address interesting I'll put that I didn't realize it was actually open for people um i'll put that on the in the show notes um yeah i may there. send you some other links if you wish uh, yeah. about the history and so on <laughs> yeah yeah so was that was this created specifically for the social bot challenge or was this something that you well, were working on anyway that's a very good question but i don't know uh, what is the answer because uh, while we were working on it you know at the beginning we had something uh, ridiculously simple and uh, because, uh, you, you know, just moving some objects on the screen and uh, step by step, it was evolving, evolving up to this uh, very big system because people are lazy. Uh, that's the nature of people, you know, so uh, they are trying tools uh, to overcome the difficulties using the tools uh, in a simpler, lazier way. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we created this system and what more? Uh, the system is uh, so simple that people who are not programmers are using it. So mm -hmm. uh, we can, uh, we have actually uh, in our team people who are uh, not uh, or without the technical education, who are like linguists or you know people who uh, work with uh, psychologists and uh, people like that. And uh, these people are helping us to create. Uh, interesting dialogues and certainly psychologists know how people talk or have uh, many many different tricks how to make you say something what they want mm, yeah <laughs> so Beha be <laughs> behavioral <laughs> economics definitely <laughs> that exactly is, that, exactly yeah that is that is very interesting so so tell us about the team then. So you mentioned the linguists, potentially psychologists. Obviously, there's some engineers in there. Like, it, the, how many was there? About eight people in a team, nine, something like that. Well, uh, for the artist, uh, and uh, as I said in the previous uh, previous years, we have been using uh, exclusively the stuff uh, which would uh, which was given us to Amazon. So we were like uh, five uh, people. Uh, but step by step, uh, because uh, companies were asking us uh, to create a version of Arquist for uh, their use, especially com uh, car companies. Uh, we worked for IBM, uh, sorry, for BMW, and we worked also for Škoda Car Company, which is the local uh, car company part of uh, Volkswagen. 
and mm -hmm. uh, so we were uh, and these uh, applications are slightly simpler uh, than uh, the full conversational applications because in the car you usually have the goal so you need uh, you understand or the driver knows uh, what uh, he wants to achieve like uh, i don't know set the destination into the navigation system so that's a uh, much better defined task than uh, you know talking about i don't know giraffes mm -hmm. so uh, basically uh, we have been using uh, this system and we can uh, very quickly develop uh, this kind of applications, show the application and always uh, the management had a uh, lot of uh, wishes and a lot of comments so we can very quickly enlarge the system and customize it to, to the needs and this led us to starting the, the startup uh, and uh, there we uh, we have now like uh, 20 people, 25 people. Uh, these people are not full-time employee. Many of them are students, so they they have a part job. But uh, uh, we have uh, like a multidisciplinary team. It's not only technicians or not only NLP people, but people uh, from many other disciplines. And uh, technicians are learning from them. You know what it is to nicely talk to people what it is well-being and uh, how to become friends and uh, what uh, what are the relationships and so on uh, you know technicians see everything only through error rate and accuracy mm, interesting <laughs> yeah interesting so so the, so the startup I, is that is that what prometheus ai is then or is that a still yeah, that's brand? correct yes yeah. that's correct Okay, that makes sense. I didn't realize that you'd work with your likes of BMW and Skoda and stuff like that. So is is that for, was that um, the, those companies using the Flowstorm tool? Was it using you yes. and your team to build the applications? Like how, how did those? Uh, how did we are work? actually working uh, in these companies, usually with a team preparing like future applications. So we are uh, doing uh, mock-ups uh, in some cases not ex in some cases it really works or it really does uh, what it is supposed to do it the, the, it varies depending on the uh, what's required and uh, this is all uh, this will be this has been all authored on this uh, uh, flow storm because uh, and uh, you know we have a lot of clients so uh, you can run it on cell phone and uh, uh, you can design these days in our Flowstorm. Uh, this is still not available. If you go to Flowstorm AI, you won't be able to use it, but uh, because we have not released it to a product version, but we have the preview version, uh, where the preview version includes already avatars. So we use uh, uh, this uh, Unreal Engine, uh, which is used in games and Maya, and uh, meta human and all these applications together are allowing us to create uh, uh, human beings like avatars and uh, we have lip syncing uh, plugins so you really talk to a nice lady mm -hmm. or nice girl and uh, you can have a great chat and uh, this is all running in the palm on your uh, on your cell phone interesting i think that's, I think the, that's the future <laughs> it is yeah yeah well you know we haven't stopped hearing about the metaverse since uh, since the last absolutely, few weeks absolutely think... we are you know the the sentence is we are creating content for metaverse yeah 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 that's right yeah and and it's crazy because the history of of doing that specifically on a smart speaker gives you the foundations of how it have having solid conversational competence like it's different when you've got a person in front of you because you, there's there's body language and the interaction is different but if you can design a conversation in nothing but audio then you've designed a conversation in its purest form without any other distractions and then when you add things on top of that like a, a an avatar same thing if you were to take a, a voice bot and turn it into a chat bot you're going to have a higher success because you've figured out the the raw version of the conversation that can be had without any visual aids and so then That's you add the avatar and all of a sudden you've got you've got real potential you know 
You are 100% right. That's, uh, that's correct, because if you talk to someone over the phone, uh, many times you are in doubts uh, what is the gaze of the person, or uh, is he smiling or is he not smiling. Uh, over the phone, you can still have the pitch and uh, you have the prosody, which means the melody of the voice. So you can uh, guess uh, based on the quality or on the, based on the voice or based on the sound, you can guess whether the person is upset or whether per the person is happy. But you can't do it uh, when you use Alexa or uh, Google Home or any of these ASR where you uh, don't have the information about uh, uh, what is the sentiment of the uh, of the voice uh, at the other end. And uh, obviously the same is for text-to-speech. It is uh, in many, well, these days we are getting better and better text-to-speech, but uh, to actually uh, fine-tune uh, the text-to-speech output so as to uh, get uh, some of the emotions to the voice is tricky. You have to do it manually. And sometimes uh, it's hard to do it. And simply uh, these days are popping up systems which can do this automatically on the text. And uh, if you know what kind of sentiment, what kind of emotion you are in including or injecting to voice, uh, you can the same way modify uh, uh, modify the face. You know, mm -hmm. if you uh, if you look at some act actresses, uh, what they do with their face, or not to mention Jim Carrey, then uh, you obviously uh, understand that uh, there is a lot of to do with the face. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and that's what that's what gives the conversation the dynamics, isn't it? And the pathos, you know, a serious conversation is spoken a lot slower, lower tone of voice, you know, a little bit of uh, a different tone kind of thing. Whereas an excited conversation, spoken a bit louder, spoken a bit quicker, uh, and so and so your facial expressions need to match that, and so it starts to, yeah, I can I can see, um, as I think I it was probably about. I don't know when it was, but I wrote a, a piece a while back, actually, which was that conversation design and conversational AI is going to get a lot more complex before it gets a, mo a lot more simple. And it's for this very reason, is that you've got voice, you've got then chat and text, then you've got avatars, and not just avatars with faces, like you might see on a website, but then you've got avatars with bodies. And now if your face is excited, your arms might be like this, and you've got eyes. And so it, it, there's a whole load of other parameters to tweak, to align to uh, you know, the conversation, isn't there, which... Um, which yeah is exciting territory, and I think the the metaverse stuff and the digital avatars, and and especially over time, what I think we'll see is as brands start to invest in this kind of um, technology, there'll be a lot more like branded um, avatars and and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's it's a interesting interesting time. Yes, the future is interesting, and as you said before, it's always better and better. Yes, that's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> nice, Jan. This has been absolutely unbelievable. What I'll do is, uh, what was the website link for Prometheus AI? If people want to reach so, out, it's Prometheus.ai and Flowstorm.ai. Or we have also an application which is called Talk to Puppy, where Puppy is short for Panel O Double P Y, and there you can uh, see some uh, kind of Alquist technology in action. Perfect. Well, we'll put all of those links in the show notes with some contact details for you as well in case people want yes, to reach also, out. Uh, if someone would be interesting, interested, uh, there is a, a YouTube channel which is called Flowstorm and there are short movies showing uh, the technology and showing some future uh, or some possible bots uh, for cars and uh, for health industry, etc. Perfect. Perfect. I will include all of those links in the show notes. And what, what I will say is that in a world where there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of noise in the conversational AI and voice AI community, there's a lot of people who are, uh, I would say, jumping on the bandwagon, companies that are jumping on the bandwagon, like chat platforms, sticking ASR on top and becoming voice platforms and all this kind of stuff. And all the while there is this competition and you know growth in the market what i've noticed over the last i would say 
six to eight months of focusing specifically on the VUX world about trying to separate the wheat from the chaff and trying to find the, the people who are doing the real stuff. What I've noticed is that the, the companies that are built on top of an academic background tend to be the ones that have a totally different way of approaching things. All of your team is coming from an ap- academic research-based background. You've got companies like Action AI coming out of that, Poly AI coming out of the same space, Got It AI, yeah. Chandra, Chandra's startup that, that he's involved with, um, Zero Shot Bot with Jason Mars, you know, all of these, Vlooper, you know, all of these technologies that look really exciting and that are pushing the scope of what's possible and pushing our understanding of what this stuff is capable of all seems to be coming out of academia, and it's interesting to see. Yes, uh, I think that uh, we are lucky uh, to live in these times uh, where uh, the graduates have uh, great opportunities and many graduates actually want to work for startup instead of a corporation uh, to have uh, sort of free hands and uh, uh, make their ideas or their or create uh, what they imagined before about uh, the university and uh, make it real. So that's the and and I must say that a lot of these a lot of of these people are actually uh, publishing results of their research uh, publicly for free. So. You can learn a lot uh, from uh, reading uh, many different sites, uh, including uh, your uh, podcasts. uh, And that's also one of the ways uh, how people can learn about what's going on or meet people uh, who who may inspire them uh, to do uh, their own application because, you know, it's just a spark of a second uh, where you uh, can... uh, imagine something uh, where this technology will uh, change completely the whole scenario of what we have been uh, doing the same way for centuries. So uh, we are lucky uh, that we have this opportunity and we are lucky that uh, we have these fantastic technologies and we can improve them. Nice. I couldn't have said it better myself. Perfect. Jan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Thank you all for tuning in, whether you're tuning in live on LinkedIn or YouTube or whether you are listening on the podcast. If you're not already subscribed to VUX World, please do head to vux.world forward slash subscribe. Uh, Do check out deepgram.com forward slash VUX World as well if you're looking for ASR technology. I'll put all of the links that we've spoke about today, Flowstorm AI, Prometheus AI, Poly, uh, the Flowstorm YouTube channel will all be in the show notes if you want to check that out and find out a little bit more. I'll stick Jan LinkedIn in there as well uh, if you want to reach out directly. Next week we are chatting, we've got a, a mental schedule next week. We've got UJet on the podcast, we've got Engati on the podcast, Symbol AI on the podcast and we've also got Who Else AI as well. Um, we are getting rounding off um, we're rounding off this this year in style. I'm going to not get any sleep next week. I don't know what I'm going to do. But uh, but anyway, full schedule, and hopefully you can join us next week for for some of that goodness. Uh, thank you again, as always. Oh, Steve Worswick said great stuff. Thanks, both. I appreciate that, Steve. Steve is uh, also a legend in this space, the creator of Mitsuku, uh, who is consistently voted as one of the best conversational bots out there as well. So there you go. That's a high, high praise from Steve Worswick. Thank you very much. Cool. Nice. Until next time. See you later. Thank you very much and have a great time.